Don't worry, I'm not going to leave you hanging like Chad Gable. Oopsie, the worst rapper alive. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Big Mac's back on the mic like oops. Back on the horse, still jumping through hoops. I'm missing Lincoln Pink, I don't lip sync. Just to be clear, choking isn't my kink, but I do it anyway sometimes, I guess. Gotta laugh now, die later in my times of stress. I'm blessed. Feeling good, charged up like a Hadouken. Mota Zitabanakis. See, welcome into the worst wrestling podcast. I need to update that intro. Hey, welcome in. I'm Jack Lusna, your host with the least. Uh, y'all, if you want to help support the show, super kick that subscribe button, that like, that bullshit algorithm stuff. But money in the bank is in the bank. So let's talk about it. Uh, let's start with the men's money in the bank match. It kicked off the show just like I had predicted. Um, and also like I predicted, Drew McIntyre would win the money in the bank. And we'll get to what happened with it on this same show, which is also what I had predicted. Not quite in the fashion that it actually went down. But sticking to the actual men's Money in the Bank match, I thought this was a great match. There was a lot of great spots that I really enjoyed. Uh, in particular, I thought uh, Carmelo and Andrade both looked amazing in this match. Andrade uh, hitting this like sick leg drop on Gable when he was like, hanging off the ladder you had Mello uh hit the uh hit the or sorry it was Andrade uh hit the Spanish fly on Mello uh and it was like off the off the ropes uh so it was like this crazy looking Spanish fly on the on the ladders um so they looked amazing crowd was super hot for LA Knight and Jay Uso predictably uh there were moments and I think towards the end, I really did think that Jay Uso was going to win the Money in the Bank briefcase. But no, um, you know, there was, all, again, all kinds of great spots, but it basically came down to Chad Gable climbing and he was hanging off the briefcase and Jay pulled the ladder away. And it was very reminiscent of WrestleMania 17 when Edge pulled the, the ladder away from Jeff Hardy and Jeff Hardy was left suspended hanging from the briefcase. And I, the way he was putting the ladder at first, I thought Jay was going to do the edge spot and try to spear Gable uh, and recreate that WrestleMania 17 moment. I thought he was going to climb the ladder and try and spear him. But no, uh, he actually waited for Gable to fall uh, Gable took a, a nice bump uh, on his way down and then ate the spear. And just when it looked like Jay Uso was going to reach up and grab that beef briefcase, Drew McIntyre javelins a ladder at him, just hucks it at him, knocks him down, hits him with the claymore, and it's Drew McIntyre who climbs up and claims the Money in the Bank briefcase. So, so far, uh, if you had happened to watch the predictions preview show that I did with SC Romero, I'm uh, one for one on my predictions. And then we head into the rest of the card, which basically, yeah, fuck my, every everything else I predicted, I think, uh, except for um, like uh, the outcome of the six man tag, uh, everything else was shot to shit in terms of my predictions. Um, so this was basically where I stopped being right. Uh, but this was a bit of a clusterfuck of a pay-per-view. I'm not going to lie. And the reactions online very much telling the story of this felt like a very polarizing pay-per-view. And it's funny because, uh, you know, shout out to Santi Zap, a uh, huge creator in the space. He had put out... Uh, his usual tweets of like, what are your opinions on money in the bank? Uh, my first initial gut reaction was this is either the greatest money in the bank pay-per-view we've ever had, or like the worst money in the bank pay-per-view we've ever had. Cause it feels like so much happened, but at the same time it was like 
a lot of really weird bullshit at the end of the day. So I'm, I'm curious to see kind of, you know, not just people's reactions right now, but I'm curious to see what the reactions will be like when we look back on this pay-per-view in a couple of years. Uh, but we get to the Intercontinental Championship as held by Sami Zayn taking on the young stud up-and-comer, hot and heavy Braun Breaker. And uh, I had Braun Breaker winning this match. Or if he was going to lose, it was I thought it would be like by disqualification because he would just get like so insane with rage that he would just literally kill Zayn uh, and end up getting disqualified. And because obviously the title can't change hands on a disqualification, you would still have Sami Zayn as the Intercontinental Championship. But in a situation where, you know, he, he did actually kind of take the L, but, you know, got to keep the, the belt by a technicality. Um, but they didn't go that way. They, in fact, went the complete opposite way. And yes, they were telling the story that, you know, Braun Breaker was very much overlooking Sami Zayn, who is, by all rights and merits, one of the most resilient superstars on the roster, especially in kayfabe, when you talk about, you know, the, the existence of his personality and character within the confines of the WWE universe. But even if you want to just talk about Sami Zayn as a man, I think, you know, the resilience of his character is something that's always been there. And so for Sami Zayn to win clean, I don't hate that they did that because again, you, you were already telling the story of Braun Breaker overlooking Sami Zayn and Sammy being able to weather the storm of, of Braun Breaker and take him into deep waters, because as much as Braun Breaker is incredible, he is still essentially a rookie on this main roster. And, you know, Sammy Zayn, a veteran that's been around the block. So I understood the story that they were telling. It just felt like the finish was a little bit lacking because ultimately uh, you had um, – Sami Zayn hit a halluva kick uh, on Braun Breaker. Like they were kind of going back and forth, and then uh, he stunned Braun Breaker, uh, and he got and then hit him with the halluva kick, and it was just the one halluva kick, and he ate that pin one, two, three, clean in the middle of the ring. So again, I understand the story that they're telling, where it's like Sami Zayn being one of the most resilient superstars on the roster establishing his own legacy as the intercontinental champion not only ending the iconic reign of gunther but now obviously being one of the only men to hold a clean win over braun breaker um i i think now the story that they're going to tell is that breaker is going to sh show some respect to sammy because at the end of the day they're both positioned as baby faces but I feel like this is going to push to a rematch where Braun Breaker is like, look, I'm not going to overlook you this time. We're really going to go to war here. And I think that's going to be the match where Braun Breaker ends up winning the Intercontinental Championship. The only, unless they, you know, I could see them pivoting. Maybe it ends up being a multi-man match uh, by the time we roll around to SummerSlam. So we'll, we'll see how they tell that story. Uh, but I, I do see Braun Breaker getting that intercontinental championship probably between like by like at SummerSlam. I'm assuming that they're pushing to have the match at SummerSlam and have them win there. Uh, so next, this is kind of where uh, things fell apart also with how I had predicted the order of the matches because I thought that they would have the women's uh, money in the bank match in the middle and then the six man tag, and then you go with the world heavyweight championship finish. But no, they went with the world heavyweight championship right smack in the middle of the card. Damian priest defending against Seth Rollins. If Seth Rollins wins, Damian priest is out of the judgment day. If Damian priest wins, Seth Rollins can no longer challenge for the world heavyweight title as long as Damian Priest is champion. And now you have, because of 
what happened earlier on the card, the looming presence of the Drew McIntyre cash in. So you have all, all of these. And then even on top of all of those things, right before Damian Priest goes out, uh, he essentially tells everyone uh, in the Judgment Day, like, make sure you stay in the back. Don't get involved in my business. And then he makes like an extra point of looking at Finn Balor and saying to Finn Balor, like, don't, don't come out tonight, basically. And then as he's leaving, you get the shot of Finn being like, yeah, whatever you say, boss. And he's like, obviously, you know, pissed about. So they're sowing all these seeds of what could potentially happen in this match. And ultimately, this was this was some chicanery. This was some clownish behavior, I feel like. This was, this I feel like was a misstep in the booking. I'm going to call it like I see it. I disagree with how they went about this. And it's not even just because of how I had predicted uh, things turning out. I just feel like you you did a disservice to Drew McIntyre in this in this match. And I I I totally understand the story that they're telling with Drew McIntyre. And I do think that that feud is very hot right now. It's probably one of the hottest feuds in wrestling. But there, there's a couple of moments that I ultimately disagree with. And so just to lay it out, and also there was this huge botch. So let's let's talk about the botch because Triple H even had to address it on the press conference. That's how bad it was. Uh, Seth Rollins hits the superflex into the uh, the superflex the the superplex into the Falcon Arrow, and it seems like there was supposed to be the cue of Drew's music, but the they missed the music cue, and because of that, Damian Priest actually didn't kick out. The ref counted three, and Priest did not kick out. The match is over. The ref kind of just then barrels through it. This is where. If you are Damian Priest, this is on you, my man. I'm so I'm sorry. I like Damian Priest. Uh, I feel like he's a better in ring technician and wrestler than he is on the uh, a promo worker on the mic. And because of that, I feel like this is a little bit extra egregious. There is no situation where you don't kick out of that, even if the cue is supposed to be the music hitting it too, I would still, for the sake of kayfabe, make sure that my shoulder rolls up a little bit, regardless of whether the music's going to hit or not, because if you don't, you get exactly what happened, which was, this was like a pretty obvious and bad botch right smack in the middle of the ring where it looked like your champion got counted one two three and you just kept going with the match because reasons and then you have drew mcintyre come out immediately after that turns it into a triple threat match and while he's trying to cash in all of a sudden cm punk shows up and attacks drew mcintyre uh he's whipping him with a chair he's choking him with the cable on the outside uh, he ends up grabbing the, the world title. And this is the, the, the part that I thought also kind of, there's a beat where you, now you're making punk kind of look silly too. So punk's holding the title and he goes and he smacks drew McIntyre with it, essentially costing him the, the championship and ensuring that it stays on Damian priest. Which by proxy also screws over Seth Rollins, right? So you could argue he's screwing both his opponents at once, but he's also screwing himself because it's like you obviously have the match with Drew McIntyre at SummerSlam. You could have been competing for that World Heavyweight Championship that you supposedly were chasing at the Royal Rumble before you got injured. So, and it, I also think it would have been a really big swerve in terms of the storytelling process of like if CM Punk's holding that title and he's looking at that title and he's registering in his mind and you tell that now you're able to tell that story because Punk is a cerebral superstar. You have him boom, 
Drew McIntyre with the title, but then also look at the title and realize, wait, if I put this title on McIntyre and I'm the cause of it, not only can I, you know, drive that worm into his mind, but now I'm set up to compete for the title at SummerSlam. And so is Gunther. So you turn that into a triple threat match for the world heavyweight title, Gunther versus Drew McIntyre versus CM Punk. That would be, that's kind of, I honestly thought where they might be going with it, but no. Now it seems like, assuming we get Drew McIntyre and CM Punk at SummerSlam and then again at Bad Blood, uh, or I don't know if they would push all the way to Bad Blood, and then probably eventually at WrestleMania also, it it's like, okay, well now, are you basically telling me that we're getting Damien? So it's Damien Priest versus Gunther. That's a weird match. I don't know if it's, maybe I'm the one, but I'm like, I don't, the only thing I could see is if they were somehow able to pull the Damien Priest face turn between now and SummerSlam, or it's at SummerSlam that you have Finn Balor directly cost him the World Heavyweight Championship and start that feud. I don't know. It's interesting to see where they're going to go with Damien Priest versus Gunther when now, obviously, you've had CM Punk cost Drew McIntyre the title yet again. And now it seems like they're going to be fighting over the bracelet. And, you know, and there's the whole thing even, again, um, Drew McIntyre basically like attacking the the Money in the Bank panel after the pay-per-view. And then he there's even this moment where he's throwing referees around and then he actually elbows uh, Adam Pierce in the head. So there'll probably be repercussions from that on Monday Night Raw to come. So again, a lot of things going on uh, with this match. Um, and uh, I I glossed over it. There was obviously a huge announcement on the show. I'm saving that for the end. If you're wondering, if you're like, hey, what about the... I'm saving it, guys. I'm saving it. It's okay. It's coming, all right? Um, so yeah, and then after... The, the whole fuckery with the World Heavyweight Championship. We get the women's Money in the Bank match. And this was a bit of a clusterfuck, too. So you had a lot of uh, kind of fucky spots. Now, I want to say, though, this was still a great match. The women put on an excellent match. I think, uh, arguably, you could say it was even better than the men's match in terms of the way that they told the story within the match and uh, with the characters that they were using. I loved, especially like the the rivalry uh, continuing to develop with Io Sky and uh, Lyra Valkyria, and you had that six spot where Io is just stomping her face on the ladder. Um, so there was a lot of really great stuff in this match, but ultimately it came down to I really wanted Chelsea Green to win, but Chelsea Green got her moment instead in terms of she was the one that delivered maybe the spot of the night uh, going off the top of the ladder. So it's her and Tiffany Stratton, who had kind of formed like uh, an alliance during the match. Ultimately, they are both at the top of their ladders, vying for that Money in the Bank briefcase. And then Stratton starts pushing that ladder, and Chelsea Green's like, no. And then, boom, goes out the ring through the double tables. Fantastic spot. Love Chelsea Green so much. But, Tiffany Stratton. It's Tiffy time because she is your new Money in the Bank women's uh, briefcase holder. And she will be a legitimate and viable threat to cash in on Bailey. So I do like uh, the decision to go with Tiffany Stratton. I think she's a very deserving uh, candidate. And unlike the men's Money in the Bank, ideally this is what your Money in the Bank is supposed to do is elevate a superstar who is already doing great work and is kind of scratching that surface of being in the main event. You put that money in the bank briefcase on them and you let them run with it. Uh, so I think Tiff and I think Tiffany Stratton too is a character that will do well holding the briefcase because not every character looks great holding the briefcase for so long. I think Tiffany Stratton she could hold it for literally an entire year. I wouldn't bat an eye. 
So I really love the decision uh, to put the, the, the case on her. Uh, so shout out to Tiffy Time and congratulations to her. And finally, not finally, but finally in terms of the matches, we get the six-man tag match uh, with RKKO, Cody Rhodes, and the Bloodline from Wish. Bloodline 2.0 with uh, Solo Sokoa as your tribal chief, uh, backed up by Jacob Fatu and the Tonga Boys. And there was a hilarious spot uh, during the match where Tonga Loa, I finally learned his name, Tonga, I call him Other Tonga. When Other Tonga tried to go in and hit a low blow, and he basically, like, he missed. He straight up missed, and he shoved his fist right up Kevin Owens' ass. It was actually really funny. And then he had to, like, do it again. Um, and when he did it, it was like, because Kevin Owens was going for, like, a package pile driver, it was almost like he punched uh, his brother in the face or whatever. So it's just a, a bad looking spot, but overall the match was like, okay. It was a bit of an overbooked mess and I'm not going to lie. I'm an old man. I was definitely starting to get a little sleepy towards the end of the night. Uh, but you know, I did, uh, mostly stay away for, for this match, but ultimately they, once the ref bump happened, uh, just everything started happening left, right, and center it was kind of all over the place. Uh, but it came down to, and what I liked about what they did was you had to have the bloodline go over. That was for sure. There was no way that they weren't going over. I knew that was happening. And I even, this is actually the only other prediction I got correct on the preview show was I said, not only that we, uh, bloodline would go over, but I said, Cody was eating the pin. I said, Cody was eating the pin and it was probably solo was going to pin him to set up the match for SummerSlam. But uh, I was like, Cody's definitely eating that pin. Uh, and he did. He did, in fact, eat that pin. He ate it from Solo Sokoa. But really, they made Jacob Fatu look like a fucking monster. Uh, and there was this uh, great spot where Randy, Hart, Randy Orton hits the draping DDT on uh, Jacob Fatu, and he no-sells it. Like, And Randy goes to do his classic like uh, Viper thing where he turns around to do the RKO. And he, he just sees feet and he starts looking up and he, like confused almost. And he sees Jacob Fatu and he's like, oh shit. So that was a great spot, but they really made Fatu look like a fucking monster. And ultimately he was responsible for just killing everybody and then uh, holding Cody while Solo Sokoa was able to hit that spike. And then he Fatu goes out, throws the ref back in, uh, wakes his ass up. One, two, three, and that is the end of the Money in the Bank pay-per-view. You have the bloodline standing tall. And uh, like I said, probably sets up Solo Sokoa versus Cody Rhodes for the World Heavyweight Championship at SummerSlam. Now, uh, the one thing I very obviously clearly skipped over, uh, the John Cena retirement announcement. So I saved this for last on purpose because uh, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, Cena. And so just to, it, you know, if you're not already aware, which you probably are, if you're a wrestling fan, John Cena came out. Uh, it was actually before the World Heavyweight Championship match. And he announced that he would be retiring from the WWE. Uh, but he is going on the Brian Danielson retirement tour. So I think, and it's funny because I have a very complex relationship with John Cena's character. And I want to be very clear about that because John Cena as a person, I do not vibe with at all, but respect wholeheartedly 100%. And when I say that, I mean like, to give an example, the one thing I always kind of lean back on is the, the documentary of uh, him and uh, Nikki Bella uh, and like when they had uh, Daniel Bryan and uh, Brie Bella had to come over and stay at John Cena's house and he had John Cena's house rules and it was like all these ridiculous things and the look on Daniel Bryan's face was like the look that I would have on my face 
And again, just a lot of the ways that he is very rigid uh, and a lot of the ways that his character presents and the a lot of the things that make him successful those are not things that I vibe with. Like if I'm like, if we're going to be friends, like if we're just chilling, you know what I'm saying? So there's no illusion. There was never an illusion in my mind where I identified with John Cena in that way. And also I fucking hated his character. I was one of the John Cena haters growing up because, uh, you know, and again, I'm coming off an era of like I was spoiled. I think with Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio and The Undertaker and Edge and the SmackDown Six and the you know RVD and a lot of my favorite wrestlers were just such incredible talents. And you had fucking Cena and his stupid rap gimmick and his four moves of doom, and it got over in spite of. And I didn't even like it then. And it got over. And then when uh, he came out with the hustle, loyalty, respect, super Captain America baby face shit. Oh, fucking. Oh, I hated it. And then he went on the, the crazy run where it just felt like he couldn't he couldn't take a loss. Like um, the even when Edge finally cashed in on him at New Year's Revolution, it's like you forget that he started and went through an entire Elimination Chamber match and won that match. And they even almost teased him uh, beating Edge in the cash-in, which was crazy. Uh, so, But Edge did actually win that cash-in. Thank fuck. But it's like he buried the Nexus. Early Cena, I think people forget how easily hateable he was especially because that was one of the first um, iterations of being spoon fed, like the company guy that we're all supposed to get behind. And then you had it with Roman Reigns after that, but Cena was another fucking level. And it took Cena years to get to the respect level of uh, let's go Cena, Cena sucks. Like I think people forget that let's go Cena, Cena sucks. That took years of him establishing himself as a true WWE superstar and <clears throat> even improving his <clears throat> move sets and having killer matches with AJ Styles. It's like a lot of the let's go Cena, Cena sucks came from that era of John Cena, which was like he had already been in the fucking WWE for like 10 years, it felt like at that point. So Again, it took a long time, I feel like, for true John Cena haters like myself to get around to respecting his character and the longevity of the character. And I did respect eventually that he never turned heel in spite of everything, which, you know, he definitely could have um, along the way. But obviously with all the stuff he did with a Make-A-Wish and being the, the record holder by like a million for um completing make a wish uh foundation wishes like the the way that he treats fans and the way that he is in his uh life uh from all respects and uh reports of you know how he treats people that's what i respect about john cena as a person and i that comes through in his character and it again Took a long, long time, but it's like, okay, at that point, well, now I, you know, it's hard for me to still hate you when I respect you as a person. And it, it becomes a thing of like, well, now I respect the character and now I respect you. And it's like, oh, maybe I like John Cena. So it's funny how, again, it's like, and it, there is a little bit of now, it's almost like nostalgic when he comes out in a sense. Um, so I do think he has finally reached the true baby face that they always wanted him to be, uh, now that, but like I, like he said, he announced his retirement. So he is going to be doing a retirement tour, uh, essentially, uh, in the press conference after he clarified that even though this will be his last WrestleMania, he is not retiring immediately after WrestleMania. He basically is planning to do. 30 to 40 dates 
uh, through 2025, ending in December 2025, which would obviously be before the next WrestleMania. Uh, so, yeah, it sounds like uh, we're going to get a not full-time John Cena, but obviously a more involved John Cena on this retirement tour. He's definitely going to be having some dream matches, I would assume, along the way. I'm hoping, I'm actually hoping that they give him uh, the title run. I don't think he needs Cody's title. Uh, I think you could put him on Raw, actually, and he would immediately become a viable threat for the World Heavyweight title, uh, which would still count towards the, you know, that would make him the 17-time breaking Ric Flair's record. Uh, so I think, I think there's a lot of things that you can do with John Cena as a character still, and especially the idea of the retirement tour, uh, kind of similar to what Brian Danielson has been doing in AEW, you know, essentially living out his wrestling dreams and wrestling all his, um, you know, dream matches and getting to do them in CMLL and NJPW and AEW and, you know, being able to work uh, with an amount of freedom. You know, John Cena, obviously, always going to be the WWE guy. He's going to get his own version of that, it feels like, in WWE. So huge respect to John Cena. Uh, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the retirement tour. I know it shook a lot of people. Uh, when he came out and said, I'm retiring, I I immediately was like, please let this be a fucking AJ Styles angle. Uh, but then when he clarified that, like, I'm retiring, but this is I'm going on my retirement tour and we're ending, we're wrapping this up in December of 2025. All right, cool. I'm down with that, uh, especially because. I am always of the opinion, and this is just not even just a wrestling thing, but a sports thing in general. I prefer when athletes are able to take their career into their own hands and decide like, hey, this is going to be my last year, uh, you know, get that uh, amazing final run and then kind of retire on their own merits and decision as opposed to being forced into retirement either through injury or just because you get so damn old that you just literally can't do it anymore. You're out there like fucking 70 years old, like Ric Flair still trying to go, you know, respect to Ric Flair, but there gets up that you eventually get to a point where it's like, people don't want to see you wrestle anymore because they love you because they don't want to see you get hurt. Um, so I think, you know, again, seeing John Cena and not like saying like John Cena is like super old or anything, but being able to compete at a high level and also still manage the film career that he has and the acting career that he has and all the other stuff that he does. Uh, obviously, it's a grind. Uh, so I think giving us this final retirement tour is a way to, you know, come to a cathartic end to his uh goaded career because i would regardless of how i feel about john cena i would say that he is one of the greatest of all time at this point um and i mean it's been that way for a minute uh but i like when you think of eras john cena is the face of the era between stone cold steve austin and the rock and roman reigns and seth rollins and and that generation um i really you know, it's, that's how I, like, if you were to really force me to pick, like, uh, from my lifetime, essentially, who I view as, like, the the Mount Rushmore, in my opinion, it would be Hulk Hogan, Stone Cold, John Cena, and then Roman Reigns. That's, for me, those are, like, the four faces that you could argue carried those generations or marked those generations the most. Um, and again, I always say Austin and the rock, cause honestly, to me, they're, they're very simultaneous. Uh, but if you force me to pick, I feel like Austin was a little bit more of the catalyst in that era. Like the, the stone cold pop was crazy back then, but we're getting, we're getting way off track here. Um, so I'm just going to wrap it up. Uh, ultimately, I enjoyed Money in the Bank, even though it was definitely a bit of a clusterfuck. Um, you know, again, huge shout out to John Cena. And uh, I am very excited to see uh, the retirement tour. I'm excited to see um, 
what they're going to do with uh, Damien Priest and how they're going to tell this story with him and Gunther. Uh, Cause I think it's a little bit of a weird matchup uh, and I wasn't expecting them to actually go that route. So now I'm kind of interested to see what they're going to do with that and how they're going to tell that story. And um, I'm sure, like I said, Braun Breaker will get his shot at the IC title again and maybe get that belt probably at SummerSlam. Huge congratulations to Tiffany Stratton uh, for winning Money in the Bank. Unfortunately, congratulations to Drew McIntyre for winning and then fucking it up an hour later and getting your ass beat by CM Punk once again on some clown shit. And, uh, you know, I guess a shout out to Solo Sokoa for finally getting a fucking meaningful win because uh, this guy lost like 40 straight matches to LA Knight and then went and stole the Ula Fala and started calling himself Tribal Chief like I'm supposed to take him fucking serious. So, hey, shout out to him too. And shout out to you guys for watching this video. I appreciate you guys like always. If you want to see some more stuff, you can always uh, hit me up at Jack Bluesley on all my socials or you can send emails to worst sports channel at gmail.com if you guys have like uh pay-per-views i want to see reviewed if you have ideas for the show if you have questions if, uh ask me anything go ahead send them in uh but until the next time i'll catch all of you guys on the flip side my positive contact results in affirmative impact never pulled the rats on raps i'm never primitive but then vicious characteristics i read the different potency of aesthetic genes yo and with the hmc's that are short and never speed some of the is light some of the razor blades and grease in your bare feet i see your fucking colleagues misprize you very much to your dismay so today i can say you won't be running away once your tail between your legs i'm gonna advocate when you fail before stakes i'll take a hack